A very good morning to you all. Welcome to Sunrise Daily this lovely Friday morning. I am Chamberlain Osa reporting live from Abuja. You don't always have to rub it in, bro. Anyway, this is Lagos. I'm Ayo Makede, and you're welcome to Sunrise Daily. Yes, indeed. It's a beautiful Friday morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. It's Sunrise Daily on Channels Television. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. I always think someone is rubbing something. <laughs> 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 but speaking about rubbing something in, we can't afford to forget about this ongoing as you strike, can we? Mm. We know that nuns have spoken of, they protested, uh, unless we're asking for more of those kind of protests to keep our attention on that particular one. And we also do know that, yeah, uh, the campaigns are on at the moment from all the political parties who are vying for one position or the other. But the House of Reps, yes, they, they did uh, try to take a look at some of those challenges. But we also do remember that the president said that uh, he, they were going to have a second look at their stance when yeah, that meeting with the vice chancellors, having tried to sort out the confusion that emanated when the NUC had directed universities to reopen. And of course, they know they can't. Uh, it's a different kettle of fish entirely. It's one thing to give that order. even. Yes, they retracted it eventually, but importantly, we need to also keep our eye and get to hear them commit and speak and see they take actions to ensuring that that is done. Because if we're waiting for the courts to decide this, you know how this may not necessarily provide the kind of solution. Having seen the way the first case went and how ASU digging their heels in, appealing that matter. So, um... Who knows? Because, look, this kind of matter is something that uh, we think can be addressed right there on the negotiation table. Because I don't know how the courts will sort all of this. Now, you've seen how it's, uh, when the first judgment went the way of FG, you saw the stance of ASU. So you could almost expect the same thing if it goes the way of ASU. Uh, government may also dig their heels in. And to what end? Uh, because at the end of the day, the students are the ones who are taking the brunt. And by extension, the country, the education sector is taking a huge hit. I mean, they keep telling us, yes, we're here to ensure that your lives are better. Yes, we're ensure to do the best we can for you. But right here on our faces, we see that this has not been addressed. So um, the meetings of the House of Reps notwithstanding, it's welcome. It's happened before. We're hoping perhaps this one may be different. And so... Who knows? And you'd have thought that, well, now that if they're all going to appear before the committee or continue that meeting, what about we drawing the case from court and say, okay, you know what? Let's sort this out. This should be given the huge attention and importance that it deserves because this is not serving anyone any better, I reckon. Indeed, Chamberlain, it's a very, very critical, you know, that action is entering the seventh month, I believe, at this time. And, uh, you know, Nigerian students are weary, they are anxious, they are frustrated. And uh, from one of our reports, they don't believe that they will, in fact, get value for money, for the money they paid um, when they indeed resume, uh, because they'll be resuming into the hands of equally unhappy and unfulfilled lecturers. That's a very, a very important factor to consider. Uh, if we were also to consider anything from that hearing uh, yesterday at the House of Representatives, brokered, uh, I believe, by the Speaker, there were a lot of I issues emanating with state officials, um, you know, giving their own side to the story about how, indeed, government always has to borrow to pay salaries, about how, if ASU is insisting on going with their own UTAS, then every other government agency will position to say that, okay, we are peculiar as well. We would have to uh, present our own payment platform. And, uh, you know, if we were to take a look at those uh, positions on their merit, um, then government must uh, demonstrate, be seen to be trusted, uh, if indeed you want IPs to be the payment platform. How reliable, how dependable is IPs? ASU has come up with a lot of um, you know, reservations about that payment platform. And in fact, reports from the state government, from the federal government rather, also uh, reflect you know, some of the issues bedeviling 
eyepiece. We can't even begin to talk about that because that's a subject on its own. Now, if indeed government is borrowing to pay salaries, government is bo borrowing uh, to service debt, government is borrowing to service um, fuel subsidy, we could go on and on. Uh, but indeed, that intervention by the Speaker of the House of Representatives uh, is the way to go, as you've said, Chamberlain, uh, the courts may not be um, quick enough to resolve this all-important issue in good time so that our students can return to school. And if we can rely on the words of the speaker that uh, the white paper is before Mr. President, it's been seven months. Why is it taking forever to sign? Ayo. Um, I'm not even as bothered about that as I am about the, first of all, how long it's taken. And I'm not talking about seven months. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about how long this has been on for. And we're talking about something that started in 2001. The 2009 agreement is a rehash, a renegotiation of the 2001 agreement. And the problems of us who didn't start in 2001, the problem of us with federal government didn't start in 2001. So I find it a little interesting that the president had to call uh, is it the president or the, 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 the minister of education? I'm not sure who right now. The vice chancellors of the universities and say, come to a meeting. Let's have a conversation and make sure that strikes don't happen in your schools. For God's sake, how, why does that have to take the president? It means, what, or rather, it suggests that whatever it is that is happening in the universities is above, quote unquote, the pay grade of the vice chancellors and the president is like the visitor. And then they have chancellors, people who have influence in the country who could not intervene until ASO had to go on strike over and over and over again. Go on strike, call it off, go on strike, suspend it and all of that. For me, Chamberlain, this only speaks to one thing. Chamberlain Abukola, it only speaks to one thing. How seriously or not do we take the issue of education? For me, that is the issue. Do we consider it an important issue, a matter of national importance? Do we consider it important? The people in government, the political appointees of 2001 and 2009 are not the ones that are there now. It's another set of people altogether, a different political party altogether. But there is a continuum. There are civil servants in office. So who is it? that has not Nigerianized their decisions, that has seen us going around this merry-go-round until this moment. And what's the assurance, Chamberlain and Bukola, that we will not come by this route again? This, in my opinion, as you mentioned, Chamberlain, is an election matter. It's an election issue. And whoever it is that is going to take on this, let's have someone come out and say, I will end ASU. I, I will end ASU strikes. Mm -hmm. There have been several attempts to proscribe ASU. It has not worked. So let's just forget that one. Right. Let's make sure that our education system works in the interest of the future of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That's my take, Jimberley. Well, well said, guys. I mean, it's something really important that uh, no matter what happens, the question will always be, you have to solve this as you strike. You just have to address it. Bottom line, that's just the way it is. That's why they're there, to solve those challenges. So, um, well, that's it. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the dailies, guys. We'll start off with Vanguard newspaper here today. 2023, furore in APC of a campaign team list confusion over Adamu's letter to Tinubu. Letter, not from Adamu, says APC NWC. Adamu out to hijack campaign cancel, ascribed to Tinubu. Tinubu not ill in London, source, may meet Wiki, others to make more concessions to APC NWC. So, all of this back and forth, just uh, playing itself out and uh, while they were at it, peace accord, Buhari, Abdul Salami, Jonathan demand issue-based campaigns 
as candidates signed peace, uh, peace pact. So that uh, was also part of the main highlights of what transpired yesterday uh, as reported here on the front page. So don't forget, you can look at that one. And then look at the back page of Vanguard here today. NFF election, who replaces Pinnick as president as AGM elective Congress holds in Benin. Appeals court gives green light. FIFA, CAF, observers on ground. So that will be interesting. So uh, we wish them all well. So let them go ahead and let's see where the pendulum swings. Uh, that's Vanga today. Okay, the next protest will probably take place in Abuja because you didn't take Mr. and Mrs., but I'll let it slide for now. Nigerian <laughs> Tribune is on the front page, uh, uh, has on its front page the same thing as the Vanguard newspaper, and this is the way it puts it, as you can see. Controversial letter unsettles APC. And the writers are equally interesting. Document claims Adamu accuses Tinubu of sidelining NWC in campaign committee membership, says Faleke acted in bad faith, demands withdrawal of list. We aren't aware of any letter, Tinubu camp. Adamu didn't write any letter to Tinubu as subscribed to APC. This is interesting. So if the chairman of the, of the party, the national chairman of the party is not the APC, or rather speaking for APC, who is APC? Who wrote the infamous draft letter? Well, How did he get out? I'm not a member of APC, <laughs> and I'm not even going to bother myself. Well, that's from one political party, but look above the nameplate, and what do you see? Four PDP NWC members return suspicious 121.6 million naira paid into their accounts. And the rider, we paid no bribe to NWC members, according to PDP. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> oh, you're still taking it in. Um, that's an idea and truth. <laughs> For you. Okay, so let's now turn our attention to. The... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just take this okay. one. Okay. Um, it's about you know the issue that we raised earlier. Strike. Accountant general to meet ASU to resolve payment platform. They have to take this long. Anyway, just resolve the matter and let everyone go back to school, right? We hope. That's our expectation. So let's turn our attention now to Daily Independent this morning. And it's, to a large extent, in agreement with uh, the Nigerian Tribune. But it starts differently. Daily Independent leads with the ASU story. Hope rises as reps broker peace between FG ASU, union to meet accountant general on choice of payment system. Bajabi Amila to transmit report of meeting to Buhari in days. Why does it have to take days? The strike is entering its seventh month. It's just a question this morning. It's good, you know, the traffic. Tra tra okay. <laughs> Let's just move on. That's a page 29 read of uh, Daily Independent. And to follow up very quickly on the PDP story from um, the Nigerian Tribune, just look beneath the name, beneath the picture. Uh, close to the bottom strip. PDP NWC members return 122.4 million naira bribe to help fight WK allies. Sorry, it's not attributed, so we don't know who's speaking, but you'll find that story inside Daily Independent this morning. <laughs> and the riders provide some insight. Onyilola Muazu, Shima Ihedioha, Aneni Ichin, lead Atiku's campaign in zones. No bribe was given. It's housing allowance. Well, this is attributed to the PDP. Well, when we're, as we're done with that now, let's look at uh, other interesting stories from the front page. Uh, this one is right beside that PDP story at the extreme left-hand corner, and it says, Supreme Court affirms Governor-elect Adeleke as PDP or Shuguba candidate, even as the uh, bottommost one says, uh, Lawan accepts court ruling ending ambition to return to Senate. That's a page six read um, 
from the Daily Independent this morning. And of course, that ends the review from Daily Independent. Chamberlain. Yeah, take a look at Leadership Friday next. Fresh crisis in PDP as five NWC members return 151 million euro rent loot. They're being mischievous. Money duly approved for all NWC members for two year rent. PDP acting chairman Damagu. So if this money was duly approved and then they returned it saying we don't want it anymore. And those who have not returned theirs, uh, if they claim it was duly approved, will keep it. Uh, so these persons who have returned theirs will lose it. So maybe the party will say, well, since you don't want the money that was quote unquote duly approved for you, maybe they will deploy it to other sources. And for those who have lost it, if they were assuming, you know, without conceding, that they're trying to score political points, well, maybe they get some, um, some refund or refuel from somewhere if, who knows, so that it doesn't go down the drain. <laughs> oh dear, one does never see, does it? Uh, look at the next of the writer here. It's no bribe, says spokesman. Presidential candidate signed peace accord. Committee warns against vote buying, fake news, other infractions. But guys, you ever wonder how, look at this amount of money you keep reading all over the place and you, you just think, wait a minute. Is this an industry, a manufacturing industry, where this huge amount of money keeps going back and forth? Because there are companies, MSMEs, that are folding up on a regular basis, and are there tax deductible? All these funds from this circle, goodness. Well, that's uh, for this one. That's what we've made of our politics here, isn't it? And then look at this beneath the lead story. APC in shaky start as power play threatens campaign cancel. Uh, some indicate uh, all may not be well with the party uh, if something that they um, may just be, of course they'll try and manage it all, but um, this, for the fact that it's out there in the open, you have to look, have a second look at that one. Yes, there's this beat about ASU here as well, FG to ASU. We will accommodate your peculiarities in IPs, and you thought that they had gone past this because, I mean, the ASU did tell us that government has admitted that IPs is faulty and it's not walkable. Now they're saying we will accommodate your peculiarities in IPs. Which IPs? The IPs that a government agency said failed integrity test. And now the committee in the House, I think I read a report where they said, uh, in fact, all of these payment platforms failed integrity test. Oh, boy. Well, guys, that's Leadership Friday today. Well, it's depressing enough, I, I understand. Look at Nigerian News Direct today, this morning. Presidential Campaign Council. Controversy trails Adamu's leaked letter to Tinubu. Uh, has three writers. Party discredits letter. Open letter to Tinubu. Not from us. Ascribed to Publicity Secretary. Is that the APC? Okay. And uh, the third writer says, says people are eager to serve. That's all uh, you find there, and the story, of course, is on the inside pages. Well, Chimali, you just mentioned MSMEs, my constituency. Well, look right above the nameplate. DBN disburses 482 billion naira to 208,000 MSMEs in one year. That's ascribed to the finance minister. Yes, I know some people are already picking up their calculator, dividing 482 billion by 208,000 to know how much did each one of them get on the average. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't even want to start. <laughs> okay, right uh, under the pictures on the front page, food sufficiency. Lagos State government meets foreign local investors to address deficits propel sustainable food value chain. That's also right there on the front page. Of course, all of the stories you'll find on the inside pages of the paper this morning. And from that, we'll turn our attention to Daily Trust newspaper this morning. And uh, it begins with uh, that peace accord from uh, yesterday. And uh, it, it's captioned this way, at peace accord signing, don't fight dirty, Buhari tells Dinubu, Atiku, Obi, others. And the riders provide more insight. We're at critical stage. That's uh, ascribed to former president, good luck, Jonathan. Fake news, misinformation, threat to poll. That's from the former head of state. 
uh, Abdul Salami, will monitor candidates, parties, <laughs> conduct spending that's uh, from the electoral umpire, INEC. Uh, and I believe that's a page four read from Daily Trust newspapers this morning. Uh, we hope that uh, the commission indeed follows up on candidate spending by specifically naming those parties that have hit, is it the five uh, billion ceiling, uh, according to reports from earlier, earlier on in the week, for which the commission refused to name the parties. Uh, we believe that the commission can do better than that by being more transparent. There should be no sacred cows in this process. So let's know if indeed some have overshot the spending ceiling, who are these parties? And uh, they should be held accountable. Uh, that's it for uh, the big story from the Daily Trust newspaper. Let's also look at others uh, going above the nameplate now. Sorry, beneath the nameplates to see this one coming from the PDP, perhaps rendered differently from the other PDP stories. But this is it. Are you bribed us with millions? Six PDP NWC members allege. Well, it's not ascribed, but it's a page six read, just in case you're interested and you'd like to follow up to get more inside stories about uh, that, that bribery allegation. And uh, uh, two more stories as we review Daily Trust. Governors reject FG's plan to privatize five power plants. That's a page seven read, and it's just beside the picture from the peace accord uh, from yesterday. And uh, that's the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Chamberlain. Take a look at New Telegram next. The 2023 bribery allegation rocks PDP as four NWC members return millions. Yeah, that's what it is you see here. And uh, we keep asking. Um, it's an industry to them, really. So, and, uh, well, the main industries are suffering. Wow. Okay, um, there is this at the bottom strip as well. Independence seems to have been overshadowed, isn't it? At 62, Nigeria still in search of nationhood. Unfulfilled dreams for Nigerians despite abundant resources. IBB to youths, study history to appreciate your leaders. Abdul Salami warns against campaign of calumny, vote buying. So, and then, um, yeah, she got several other ones here. Um, ISO strike, IPs will erode varsity autonomy. Osodeke, government has right to decide workers' wages in Gige. So you, you can just feel there that there's still a dagger's drawn concerning what to agree on, how to agree on. Sometimes you just wonder um, how much of the persons involved in this, how much of their personality is getting in the way of these negotiations. Sometimes you just wonder, you know, you never can tell. So um, if we were to just state, you know, if, if they were to perhaps a, a committee or a group highlight these issues, get different heads to look at these issues, will there be a solution? Is it even possible in the first place? Because this will tell you, look, we're the ones who are saddled with that responsibility. And then get the job done then. Well, that's New Telegraph this morning. This Nigeria seems to uh, to a completely different path. It's talking about the peace uh, commission side, uh, the peace accord signing of yesterday, 2023. You have to be impartial. Buhari charges judges to maintain transparency. Oh, look, it's uh, the body of benches launching. You have to maintain transparency in pre-post election matters. Commissions, benches, ultra-modern edifice. Find the details of that story on page four of uh, This Nigeria Today. And of course, that story, that picture tells a thousand words, right? Under the picture, you'll find the story. PDP, six NWC members refund over 100 million Naira after unaccounted 10 billion Naira mess. And has a rider. Money meant for house rents, not bribe. Scrap to the party. 
Again, the story is on page four of the paper this morning. And the earlier cautions on use of drugs during campaigns. Gosh, who is going to measure that? Who is going to monitor that? Who is going to enforce that? Find the details on the inside pages this morning. And from that, uh, let's quickly take a look at the Daily Times newspapers. And it's in agreement with uh, about just about all of the other papers uh, concerning the big stories, ASU and uh, the Peace Accord. Uh, so perhaps we'll just review a few of those and look at others. And the big story is captioned thus, 2023, Buhari advocates issue-based campaigns, warns politicians against personal attacks, incitement saying signing of peace accord contributed to peaceful elections in 2015. Uh, but can we, well, see the same of the other elections, the off-cycle elections? Um, is signing of peace accord routine when you look at the conduct of politicians in, you know, some other elections uh, not quite far from uh, the off-cycle elections we just conducted? Uh, let's hope that uh, these elections will be different and we'll see a more mature uh, political class uh, committing uh, to this peace accord in word and in deed. Well, that's it. And uh, beneath the nameplate, you also find uh, this one. Well, at the bottom strip now, to be precise, 2023, Tinubu absent as a Tiku will be other presidential candidates sign peace accord. Abubakar, INEC chairman, task candidates on peaceful conduct before during election that's a page three read and uh, to other stories now away from politics at the bottom strip again neko releases 2022 sse results says 60.74 percent made five credits and above that's a good one and lastly on each port ready to receive cargoes from on air Lagos Port uh, that's attributed to Niwa and it's a page five read that does it from the Daily Times newspaper. All right, take a look at the Guardian newspaper next. Comply with peace accord, Dwari Abubakar, Jonathan Tell, candidates, and then a host of riders here. Uh, Buari peace accord with Jonathan contributed to 2015 election success. Don't allow fake news derail campaigns. Leaders charge stakeholders. Vote buying, undermining democracy. Kuka warns candidates. Peace accord signifies war in Nigeria, says Showare. We will ensure full compliance with the Electoral Act 2022. Campaign signings, INEC tells parties. Um, Obi, let's thank Nigeria, not my turn in parenthesis there so but above that you also get to see uh, some uh, this is this says Beningwari Union raises alarm over the increased attacks levies by bandits in Kaduna I know what in the world right well that is a look at uh, that is the Guardian um, that's a garden newspaper this morning. I believe that ends a look at some of the dailies here this morning. We will be back in just a moment. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Yes, as you've seen right there, most Reverend Matthew Kuko joins us this morning. He's the convener of the Peace Committee. Good morning and thank you for joining us this morning, Bishop. Well, Quite interesting. Good to see you, by the way. Thank you very um, much. I don't think that... Uh... Since, since I turned 17. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, you're not doing bad for yourself and for the nation, I might add. But about the significance of this peace committee, uh, let's start off from there because this is different from the last time out. So tell us about it. Why did you adopt this measure this time? Because if you read the full text of the, of the, of the peace uh, accord, uh, it speaks to two different issues. First, is uh, it spends a lot of time, you know, explaining things that ordinarily people should know, but also rules of engagement, rules of conduct, very basic rules of civility that by now we shouldn't be talking about them, uh, but they still persist in our political system. 
But so that first part just tries to encourage politicians, you know, to, to be to respect one another, respect the rules of the game. Also submit themselves and show commitment to collaborating and cooperating with state agencies and so on and so forth in order for this, this process to be smooth. The second part of the accord speaks to the issues of commitment to accepting the results of the elections. You know? So after you finish all this, it may be two days or three days today, uh, to the elections themselves, they will sign the, 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 the second component, committing themselves to accepting the results of the elections if they are judged to be free, fair, and credible. Hmm. That's a huge one there because um, wait, why did they have to wait to sign in afterwards and not in the same breath like this one? Well, no, I mean, let me say, again, maybe, maybe I should just take you back a little bit. Um, this peace committee was not supposed to have been here by now uh, because um, when Kofi Annan, the blessed memory, uh, based on his experience uh, from the 2013 elections in, in Kenya, which went awfully bad, and the number of people that died, um, they are, they are in the Nigerian political horizon, there was this air of, you know, of gloom about the possibilities of you know all kinds of things going on in the Nigerian elections. And of course, if you if you recall, if you play the tape back, so many things had been expressed in 2011. And um, so I was I was someone by Kofi Annan whom I'd never met, although the conversation started with the Swiss embassy. Uh, focusing on what kind of lessons might we uh, learn from Kenya and how can we make sure that those kind of things don't happen. So Kofi Annan and the late, I mean, uh, of blessed memory, and Chimemeka Anyoku, uh, someone me had never met Kofi Annan before, you know, and we had a conversation at the Hilton and I was quite humbled, you know, when they proposed that um, I should convene prominent Nigerians, you know, to be able to encourage uh, and to help us draw from an inspiration that we had had with a, with a, um, a conference that had been organized by Chief Benobi, which Emeka Anyoku had the, the, the honor of chairing. And if you remember, something very significant happened. It was unprecedented. And I can tell you how excited I was to open the newspaper and even to see on television General Buhari and President Jonathan hugging one another. It was, I mean, if you talked about a picture speaking a million words, so we then had to take advantage of that. And again, happily, President Jonathan had set up the office for inter-party affairs, which Chief Benobi was the chairman. And so that's what brought this about. So there was a signing of the what would call the Abuja Accord, but there was a clause that proposed the setting up of a peace committee for the 2015 elections. So the whole idea was for us to see whether we could help Nigeria walk through this landmine to be sure that the elections you know, didn't spin out of control. So after we succeeded in that, it was assumed that we should all go shake hands and go home. Uh, but we had, we decided, uh, you know, the chairman then decided, look, let's even have a debriefing among ourselves and say, what, what, how did we really feel? Um, and if you see the kind of people that were assembled, they were very busy people. And to just assume that after that, everybody will go home. But we, we spoke to the media. We spoke to civil society groups. We spoke to the board of trustees of PDP and APC. We went to speak with the, with, with the speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Honorable Dogara then. We went to the Senate president, um, uh, Bukola Saraki then. Honor, uh, Senator Bukola Saraki was Senate president. We had a meeting with President Jonathan. We had a meeting with President Buhari, who had just been sworn in. And one and all across the board, everybody said, no, 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 the Peace Committee, can, you must remain, become part and parcel of this process. So this is how this journey has continued and brought us to where we are today. Mm. So um, this time around, you had the, the, the party chairman, also part of the fray, in an expanded session. So is it that uh, they have equally significant roles to play? Because if the candidates decide, look, yes, we are the ones here, but what role do you expect those party chairmen to play here? Well, let me, let me give you an example, you know, drawing from the, from the Catholic Church, and of course, let me say from, from Christianity, you know, when two people want to get married, you know, you have witnesses, um, and they, 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 they're not the witnesses, even the priest, is an observer of sorts, so to say, because it is the two people getting married who invite, who step forward and invite other people. So the party chairmen are important because they are more or less, you know, holding the post. Um, so they are more than just witnesses. They are pending their signature 
It's an affirmation of the commitment of the entire party apparatus to submit to the principles that have been laid down. The, 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 the presidential candidates themselves have to sign. And that's why if you notice yesterday, um, it was the chairman of the APC that signed because uh, um, Ashwaju was not uh, present. So, um, and of course, there were three other parties that didn't show up for all kinds of reasons. You know, sometimes people start off all these things and then at the end of the day, either they lose steam or they step out. But on balance, you know, we had 15 uh, you know, presidential aspirants that showed up and uh, everybody appended their signature. So it's really a, to give it a sense of validation. So the party chairman of the APC signing, uh, will they have the same import as the, the candidates well, no, themselves? Our doors, our doors are open. If you remember, um, in the 2019 elections, um, uh, Elijah Tiku Abubakar was not available. And uh, then, of course, his political opponents began to exploit that by saying, ah, you see, he's not committed to peace. And we said, no. Uh, uh, my friend, um, uh, Obi Ezekweseli, who was also a presidential candidate, was not available. But that our doors still remain open. And uh, you know, Atik Abubakar came to the Secretary of the Peace Committee, appended their signature. The same thing with uh, um, Ngozi, uh, Obi Ezekweseli. Um, so our doors are still open, and I told the chairman of the APC that much, you know, that if Ashiwaju comes back from his trip, our doors are open then. His, his signature space is still there. Okay, so this time they will sign twice. Uh, you, the second part being uh, agreeing to comply with the results of the elections if they consider it free and fair. So why go this way? Is it that the first model or method didn't achieve the no, kind the of first, results the you first, wanted? No, the first, let me, you know, we're very much encouraged, first of all, by the developments that have taken place in, uh, in, in INEC. And here I would like to actually commend the president and the National Assembly for the progress they've made so far uh, in signing the, 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 the act into law. Um, the president also has made commitment in his Onga speech, which suggests very clearly that Nigeria is committed to deepening democracy. The real challenge for us is to get the political actors themselves, you know, to sign on to, because like I said, the first part is just a, a commitment to some of the very basic ingredients of politics and any form of human relationships. There are rules to every game. But as we can see, we have come from a very tortured past, you know, where people, and this is a country where people don't take the law seriously, uh, whether it's the constitution or whatever, and that we, our responsibility is, as I said, to, to, to ensure that the actors in the long run can suffer penalties. And these penalties should include, by any stretch of the imagination, a clear commitment that the things you sign for, to cooperate with the civil, civil authorities, to obey the law, uh, to, 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 to make sure that you don't instigate violence. And I'm hopeful that going forward, if we have a tribunal or if we have a commission dealing with electoral offenses, that it will be possible. In my, this, for me, is, is, is a dream. I can speak you know, for the Peace Committee, and indeed for all Nigerians, that people must begin to suffer penalties. That you can actually have your presidential ticket, whether you win or you lose, taken away from you. You can have a, a gubernatorial ticket taken away from you because you've not played according to the rules of the game. I mean, you score a goal. The fact that there was a foul means yeah. the goal is unknown. So I think we must more or less, it's almost like a VR, you know, VR. <laughs> that's where we should be moving to because our people have shown absolutely no commitment to respect for rule of law. Well, that, that's uh, an important component to consider moving forward. But let's bring in uh, Lagos. They've got questions as well. Uh, we, we really appreciate what you're doing, you know, um, Reverend, and it's, it's amazing that this is even happening, especially at this time and since 2014, which the National Peace Committee was set up and has been sustained. But the last, to the, uh, before I come to the question that I wanted to ask you earlier, so the last bit that you just spoke about, now it's very exciting to me, because we've been talking about um, a, an Electoral Offenses Commission for quite a while. So are you saying, that the documents they sign could eventually be a kind of evidence in court to, for concerning whatever it is that they commit themselves to? Is it something that will be justiciable in the future? Is that what you're saying? I'm looking forward to that. You know, we cannot live in a country where people live by very fragrant disobedience to law. 
It's just not possible. And democracy focuses on rule of law and processes. And people cannot just sign on to these things, you know, and they get away with them without consequences. So that's why I'm saying I'm really and truly looking forward to a situation where the National Assembly itself, that is the beneficiary of these processes, and is also supposed to be responsible for legitimated processes by the quality and kinds of laws that we make. So yes, I mean, that is a goalpost we should be heading for, so that politics does not be, becomes more respectable, becomes more honorable. You know, there are too many, I mean, politics is the only thing, if you want to be a mechanic, you probably show evidence that you've learned your trade somewhere. If you want to be a teller, you have to show evidence you've learned your trade somewhere. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to show evidence. Now. Policy is the only thing you don't need a qualification to participate in. The result is that, especially in the kind of environment that we live in in Africa, too many criminals are fil filtered and found their way into politics. So I think it is our responsibility and it, to create the kind of laws and environment that will make it very difficult for criminals to walk, to walk through this system. And that people cannot go away with a price that is tempted. And I think that uh, the late um, President Yaradu of, of, of blessed memory was honest enough, was honest enough from day one to say that I won this election, but I am worried by the kind of price that I'm holding. And I will try and set up mechanism for making sure that we resolve these issues. And that's how I was lucky to have been appointed because I sat with Justice Ways, you know, to look through all these all these distortions in the in the in you know in the law. So for me, that's a goal that we should all be headed for. Well, the, the, the other angle to that, you know, is that most of the people that form in trouble, they aren't the ones that, you know, really sign the papers. As a matter of fact, what one would see is that most of the time, the conversation concerning the peace committee's uh, objectives don't generally drill down to the boys and the people, the girls who are the, the cannon fodders, if we can use that word, the people who go around campaigning for this, campaigning for that. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, is the second is part of the issues that was raised by the chairman of the National Peace Committee about you know the social media, uh, fake news, and all of those things. How does that signing play on these two issues? Look, the signing is, in my view, is symbolic, but I think it's also a commitment to good behavior. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of domestic violence going around. Uh, all the people, men and women who are involved in domestic violence, didn't sign on to that when they were getting married. You know, they signed on to certain levels of commitment. And like I said to people, and I said, you know, severally, elections are like a wedding. A wedding is not a marriage. A wedding is just a ceremony. Elections are just a process. And as we have seen, severally, they commit the promises that politicians make when they are campaigning um, take a completely different tone when they win elections. Uh, and this is why, you know, like they say to you when you enter a plane and the plane is about to land, you know, the, 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 the cabin crew will always tell you, you know, to be careful because luggage may have moved while the flight was on. So sometimes it is important that we understand that people make these promises. Very often they have no intention of keeping the promises. But it is our vigilance. It is our collective vigilance to make sure that we hold their feet to the fire. That is why civil society cannot, we, all of us cannot just be spectators. You know, we tend to assume that after we've elected these people, they will be of good conduct, they will govern us well. They've shown no, no, no inclination to anything of that sort. So it is, um, in, it is in our interest, the media, civil society, the judicial process, we must have the confidence to step up and challenge these people when, when if and when they go wrong. So if you talk about the small people in the system, Again, it is the, if you have an institutional capacity that gives you an opportunity to return to the scene of the crime and gather evidence. And this gathering of evidence means that you will have an opportunity to track and listen to stories of who did what. If a fire was lit in somebody's headquarters, who lit it? How did it happen? So for me, those are the issues. If you are not going to, the important thing is to create a deterrent and to have a deterrence culture. And people will know, you will never catch every criminal. But it must, the law must have, be of such quality that somebody knows that you cannot get away with this. And the day that somebody is pulled out of the National Assembly, and I think it has happened severally, um, the day somebody is pulled out of the National Assembly, pulled out of government house, on grounds of established evidence of malfeasance, 
That day, people will begin to learn a lesson, and our democracy will continue to grow. And we can move away from this obsession of calling on religious leaders. Politics is not about moral appeal. It's about law and its enforcement. Uh, Bishop, first of all, good morning, and um, Bishop, accept all, my morning, belated wishes on your 70th birthday, and thank you for all that you do. I'd like to talk about a deterrence culture and holding the feet to the fire, but there's something just as interesting that I'd like, like you to first of all react to, which is a comment from uh, one of the presidential candidates who said signing of peace accords show that uh, elections in, in this country are war. And I'd like to relate that to the fact that we don't quite see election observation, signing of peace accord, election monitoring in other countries that we uh, try to copy to adopt their models. But rather, it's done in Nigeria and some other parts of Africa, which suggests pretty much that uh, we can put our house in order by ourselves. Does this worry you, Bishop? And if it does, what are your thoughts in that regard? Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, the, the, the portal is still open for the collection of birthday gifts, so the, the, those are not closed. Don't worry. We're still open for business. Noted, sir. Uh, but on a more serious note, look, I mean, let's, let's concede two things. The president delivered um, an address at, at Onga, and it's a fantastic speech. But it also speaks to the fact that he's not making excuses because we cannot be part of the international community and be involved in making excuses. Our, the quality of our democracy does not meet even local standards. That's the truth of the matter. We have operated in a very convoluted environment. Look at Kenya, for example. I mean, Kenya made a lot of mistakes, but guess what? I mean, Kenya already has, has only, what, five or so presidents since their independence uh, uh, on December 13th, 1963. Um, uh, what's his name? Arab, no, no, sorry, not, Jomo Kenyatta was prime minister for one year, then he became president. No, but look at, when you transport that to Nigeria, how many, we can't even call our president, we can't even spoke, speak about Nigeria's presidents because there is a convoluted vocabulary. There are presidents, there are heads of state, there are military presidents, there are heads of government. So we don't even, we don't even have that sequence in the conversation. So the point is that in every sense of the word, very few African countries have such a checkered past as Nigeria has. The series of military coups, the distortion of the political environment, the lack of commitment to law and due process, the inability of this country having a very steady uh, national assembly. Uh, the result is that we have we, we what we have today. So the National Peace Committee, in my view, is like a midwife. By now, we should have been out of the, of the way. For me, it's not, I, don't, I don't imagine that we will continue to remain embedded in the political processes of Nigeria. But the truth of the matter is that the Nigerian political elite have shown no commitment to the rules of the game of politics. There are too many people who just see politics as a transaction. Uh, just imagine an entry fee of 100 million naira to be able to buy a form. Imagine the huge amounts of money that people are asked to pay. You know, it's just like going to watch a match or going to a nightclub or whatever. If you charge that much fee, what are you going to expect you know, when you enter the hall? So we are now hearing stories of the problems of, of vote buying and so on. If, we enter, if it costs so much to enter the door, why would you expect anything less? So the Peace Committee is just a moral authority. We're encouraging our political class, but sooner than later, it is important that Nigerians take full charge of insisting on minimum conducts that, that are acceptable to us as a people. You know, because they, 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 what is going on in Nigeria in the name of politics, it, it falls far below the threshold. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, we, need, we need to go to break now, but um, we'll return. And then the last uh, conduct, the, the conduct between uh, former President Jonathan and the current president, we'll look at that scenario and how it played into what's going on today. But that will be when we come back in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. We are with Most Reverend Matthew Kuka, convener of the National Peace Committee. Bishop, now, in 2015, when uh, President Gulag Jonathan uh, did call uh, 
now President uh, Buhari, congratulated him. That, to a lot of people, that was a typology. That was a game changer to so many things that people had known before, the impression of how we had done things here before, in politics particularly. So would we uh, consider that scenario now a culture? Is it evolving into a political culture? Because to a large extent, that, that should be some kind of standard that we should be looking at. But how significant or how deep or where, uh, what kind of role does that play in the scheme of things? Now, the politicians now see that as at least the minimum standard that they need to comply with as a result of all of this? Uh, no, the Jonathan scenario is different. And um, I don't want to say they don't make them like Jonathan anymore because there are, it's, it's about character. Um, and I think Jonathan's advantage was, apart from his own personal conviction, um, he came from a background that didn't threaten anybody. And I say this because hegemonic politics, which is the politics of dominant groups, whether they are ethnically based or whether they are, they are religiously based, whichever way they conceive their hegemony, has consequences. So when you want to break away from that, it has consequences. So the Ijos didn't threaten anybody. They had no created a hegemony. Now, if a president from northern Nigeria, and you, all you need to do is to push back and see the nature of the debate and the argument from northern Nigeria since Jonathan, or even after the end of, uh, of um, uh, Yaradua's term, oh, it's our turn. We didn't finish our turn. Um, most of that conversation is still playing out today. Um, and I think that uh, President Jonathan's significance lay in the fact that he contested an election. Okay, it wasn't as if he was like Buhari, he didn't have any chance to have another term because that induces a certain kind of behavior that is not the same with when you are contesting. So John, what Jonathan did, the significance is profound. But, and I'm not beatifying him, but I'm also just saying that um, you can trace the, the, the trajectory. So if you were, let's say, a northerner or somebody from the southwest, let's say the Yorubas, the Igbos, the, 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 the House of Fulani, or by whatever name, all these hegemonic blocks sometimes will not allow you to, to give up power because of the benefit, you know, the benefits that accrued from an entire group of people. But as I said, to answer your question, it comes down to what kind of conviction do people have? And Jonathan made the point, and it's an eloquent testimony. And my ambition is not worth the blood of any citizen. Now, we have, a, we have a, a system in which, for many politicians, there is no limit to what their ambition can, as long as it is realized. So I don't, I think, you know, Nigerians are always quick to score themselves. We, we are far away from, we have not even come anywhere close to that. Otherwise, we will not be having this conversation, because people would be saying, well, the North, you've had your turn or this group you've had your turn, but that's not where we are at in Nigeria. And because, again, like I said, you know, Niger the Nigerian political environment is peculiar. It's not like any other. This is not Kenya. This is not Senegal. This is not, this is Nigeria. We are stealing of resources and thieves are hiding in plain sight. We are people show you very clearly, you are not expected to enter this political room and come out empty handed. So we are corruption and what, you know, we are saying that we are running out of resources in Nigeria, but there is still a lot to be stolen. If they are wearing, all these people who are running around and want to, want to govern us, it's not enough for us to ask what have they been doing with their life? But it is that this is politics of access. So, and the access when it comes to Nigeria is completely different because the Nigerian president, at the end, on a good day, has the powers that no president in the world has. I don't know whether the man in China has those kind of powers, but that is just that you can assign so much to an individual by just a stroke of the pen. Are you answerable to anybody? Absolutely not. There may be institutions that pretend that they are answerable to, but. It's not the case. So you can understand why the Nigerian system is so, you know, so much convoluted and will not admit of this kind of things. So Jonathan signposted a possibility. But I don't think we can assume that we have come to a point in which the Nigerian politician is ready to stand back and say, no, this is the way it should go. All right, let's bring in guys from Lagos again. 
All right, uh, Bishop, let's now talk about the culture of deterrence. Uh, you know, it is often said that the morning shows the day, and uh, we can just pick a few examples from the consequence of uh, the conduct of primaries in the main political parties and look at the language, you know, of exchange between uh, the political actors. We can also look at, uh, uh, you know, the conduct of the off-cycle elections where there, were vo there was vote buying reported and still we have not seen any significance in terms of prosecution of those who were found wanting. And only recently, you know, the commission also talked about about how some political parties have overshot their spending limits, but yet refuse to name those political parties. How does this, um, what does this portend rather for uh, the peace accord that has been signed and what may be the conduct of the politicians in the 2023 elections? Well, I think, it, first of all, it's important not to ascribe to the Peace Committee powers it doesn't have. It's not a body that is set up by law. I mean, it's just a group of respectable Nigerians who only exercise a certain level of moral authority. They are, we cannot replace moral suasion. is not a substitute to law. It's not enough for priests. And we've been shouting all over, you know, priests and imams have been shouting about do not steal, do not steal. But that's all we can do. We, we, you know, we can't follow anybody to the bank with the proceeds of their loot. It is really the, the, the kind of architecture of, 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 uh, of consequence that is on the ground. That's what matters. But as we are seeing, even the judiciary itself, that is supposed to be the hope of the common man, as is always said, has, not, it has become encumbered with all kinds of characters who approach the courts with all kinds of frivolities. Uh, we have seen even a tendency to embed fake judicial processes in the political system. Um, so the point to make is that, look, um, people talk about institutions. And again, Kenya has given us a very good example uh, about institutions such as the judiciary and their capacity and their ability to deliver. But the fact of the matter, I'm sure if you speak to the people in INEC, they will tell you how inundated they are with frivolous court cases and so on and so forth. How to weed that out of the process and allow uh, INEC and other institutions to focus on what they were called upon to do, that's the challenge. You know, so it, it's, um, it, you must take the Nigerian political system with a very convoluted, corrupt uh, system that is Nigeria today. How you walk through all that is not a child's play. And we must not put our goalposts so much within our sights because it's going to take us. This is this is a very very long journey that we are going to you know um, participate in. It's not something that one government can pretend it wants to resolve because the problems have become so embedded and the corruption is of such depth and magnitude that it's not about one political actor just hoping and praying that he's going to fight corruption as we had and as we now see. So we just have to continue to renew our commitment and our energy to this process. And like I said, and that politicians will come close to even what ordinary Nigerians themselves uh, have in terms of their commitment to democracy. Well, Reverend, uh, all of these things that you have said, I mean, you, you've spoken quite copiously and confidently about the need for us to do certain things right. But you know, the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria asks is it currently is, share some ethos with the National Peace Committee. Um, for instance, uh, the National Pledge, National Anthem, they all talk about peace and unity and all those things. And there are things enshrined in the Constitution at all, uh, uh, it, uh, itself. But it would seem as if uh, the Constitution says some things, and you've spoken to the fact that people, some people are just generally you know, lawless and all of that. But then, on the one hand, the Constitution says this. On the other hand, it will seem like people are behaving exactly at variance with the very things that they swore to do. Is there a way, in your opinion, where we can institutionalize peace, institutionalize development, institutionalize good governance, so that the moment you get into office, you don't need to be told, you don't need to be cajoled. In fact, the moment you show interest in politics, these things are supposed to be sine qua non in your life. It ought to be seen. Is there a time or a way that you see that in this nation, peace is institutionalized, development is institutionalized, good governance is institutionalized 
for posterity's sake? Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because um, the assumptions you have about peace are not real. Uh, remember that the only reason why the devil is here is because they fought the war in heaven. Um, <laughs> We will never attain that set of peace because if that is the kind of peace you want, then you go to the graveyard because there's nobody to say anything. As long as human beings exist, look, I mean, I always tell people, if in your house you have your first child is five years, another one is two years, another one is one year, by eight o'clock or nine o'clock, the house is quiet. But when your children are 20, 17, 15, you cannot tell them, stop watching television, it's time for bed. They'll tell you, no, daddy, I want to finish watching this cartoon. It's a bargain, it's a negotiation. Look, peace is not, it's not, peace is not a destination. I mean, in a way, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a point you just say you're going to attain uh, a kind of nirvana, you know. It's not, it's not like that. It would be an extraordinarily boring life if we didn't have, then where, what would the courts be doing? What would the police be doing? This is who we are as human beings. So the question is, how do you regulate the ring in a way that there are penalties? Uh, they say in Hausa, uh, what is the difference between boxing and fighting? Um, it is that with fighting, somebody says you can bite. But with boxing, as you saw with Mike Tyson, you buy somebody's ears, he had to be fined $3 million. The question is, what are the consequences for bad behavior? And secondly, when victims of bad behavior experience their victimhood, where can they go to? The British set up in the 80s what they call a commission for racial equality. And I've been saying, we have a National Human Rights Commission, but the National Human Rights Commission probably just, it's a bureaucracy. So it's probably waiting for people to write petition and allege all kinds of things. But it is that we need a platform, we need a visible opportunity where people can say, look, I have, this is what, I've, this is what has happened to me. This is how the redress I seek. So people will know peace if they can go through a process that hears them out. So it's, I think we're really responding to the whole question of what kind of institutions do we have in place and what are the consequences for bad behavior. You will never, people drive badly everywhere in the world. But it's only in Nigeria that you drive badly and you, you can actually slap a policeman for daring to, to, to question you for driving badly. Elsewhere, because as you see, when Nigerians travel out of the country, they don't have a choice but to behave. So the question is the weakness of the architecture, of state architecture that we have that are so severely compromised that instead of the rule of law, what you have in Nigeria is the rule of men and women. So the result is caprice, and is the result of the volatility we have in the system, where there's just so much stress day in and day out. But as to as for a situation in which you'll just enter a door and everything is in peace, it's not going to be possible, and it won't happen. It will not be us as human beings. Well, clearly, a lot will be dependent on uh, INEC and the police to ensure that they play a huge role in these elections. But what is your impression about the turn of events for in the build-up to these elections, having seen the way the registration, the latest voter registration has gone, the uh, participation, the interest in the part of the young people this time? Look, you know, frankly, like I said, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I wish that the politicians were half as enthusiastic, one about this country, one about this democracy, as we ordinary Nigerians are. Um, they will go with the price. But I think that what we are also seeing, and it's new, and it's also one of the things that played out in Kenya, we have to figure out what to do with the energy of these young people. First of all, they're not just young. It's not a biological issue. It is that people are properly pretty well wired. They know how the world is set. They know about the possibilities. Okay, and like you had a little girl speak yesterday in her speech. He said, look, by our time, when I'm president in 2050 or so, I'm not going to be going around with 200, I mean with, with 20 drivers because there will be no drivers. It is that, look, um, the young people will set the pace. And it is a question of looking at the mirror and asking ourselves, when is enough enough? Uh, when are we going to be able to have a sense of respect for ourselves? And victims of domestic violence, I mean, in the Catholic Church, we, we say that marriage is, 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 is indissoluble, that it cannot be dissolved. But if a woman comes to me with a battered face and say, I cannot tell her to go back and stay because the Bible says you must stay married. It, marriage must give you certain kind of... So the, 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 the embedded sense 
in this transaction of politics that I do this and this is what I get in return. We cannot be voting and be dying while you and your children are smiling all the way to the bank and traveling across the, the length and breadth of Europe. It is not possible. It will have consequences. And I think that that energy of young people and the ordinary, with the enthusiasm we've seen, those 95 million voters must now say to themselves, look at themselves in the mirror and say, what am I worth? What kind of life do I want? I'm not listening to the promises of these characters. I'm not interested in what they're pretending they represent. I'm not talking about their past. I'm talking about the future. So it's not a question of what this guy is promising, but I'm also asking myself, given the, the, the opportunities that I have, given the quality of education that I have, who gives me, I'm not asking for jobs. So don't tell me about jobs. I'm just asking for a space that can enable me to thrive. That's why the president's speech in, on, the, on social media on Onga was very interesting. Because he, make, he admits that technology sets limitless frontiers. And technology actually moves faster than the human imagination. So a lot of these people who are in power, they don't understand tomorrow. They have no idea about what the future looks like. They're just thinking that nepotism, their children, their wives, their mistresses, and that being in power is about being surrounded. Times it's have not, it's not, it's not going to be. Times have changed. Yeah, well, a very fine place to let it go. Most Reverend Matthew Kuka is the convener, a National Peace Committee. Thank you very much. Thank Always you. a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Chamberlain. Thanks for having me. All right, we will be back in a moment here. Stay with us. All right, welcome back to Sunrise Daily. As you've seen, the, we've got Mr. Mecca here, the former governor of Imo State. Good morning, and thank you for coming on today. Yeah, good morning. You see, you haven't lost your green cap. But what informs this, this color and green cap, by the way? I love Nigeria. Um, this green symbolizes uh, my father's um, middle name. My oh. father was BMG. Uh, green uh, was his middle name. And I love our country. Uh, this symbolizes the color of our country. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. But ever since, you know, the court case, we haven't heard from you. Not many have heard you say much uh, concerning what's happened and development in the state. What have you been doing before now, from that time up until recently? Introspection makes sense to um, take your time um, when you find yourself in that situation, that circumstance. It's... it's it's important you, you take it easy. Um, uh, think through it. Um, how the journey um, to that point and the processes, um, the lessons to be learned, you internalize it and then you get ready uh, for tomorrow. Because by the grace of God, there's always a future. That's so, tomorrow. What, what, what kind of lessons would it be in this case for you? I got a judgment that was most unexpected, but I thank God for his um, grace and the support of our people, um, the preponderant support I got from people across our country, and in fact, the internal committee uh, gave me cause to be happy that indeed I um, served our people with dedication, honesty, and people appreciated my um, period of service to Imo, and so it made sense. That's one, I thank God for that. Anything could have happened. And so whatever happens, the Bible tells us, you take it as it comes. And you have cause to thank God. And of course, um, temptations are indeed part of life. Uh, trials and tribulations come to everyone. And so when it comes your way, you take it, you internalize it, you reflect over it, and then you get ready. So what have I learned? Anything is possible. And so when it comes, you adjust, you get yourself ready. Um, for the next move. Well, it appears anything is possible in these elections now uh, because yes. things, things have since changed. Because right now, yes. the presidential candidates are quite uh, different, representing different parts of the country. And then there's this comment that's been making the rounds about comments that you made concerning uh, persons who do, do not vote for, I think, your candidates, mm. considering them as saboteurs. What do you mean by that? Uh, uh, no, thank you very much, Chamberlain. Uh, I went to Ghana on the invitation of my um, kinsmen. I'm an Imbise man. I will celebrate um, the Iriji culture, New York Festival. And so 
for, for quite some time, a kinsman in Ghana had requested me to come join them. And I felt it was important to do that. So I, I was speaking to my kinsmen. That's, that, that's um, what it is, and predominantly uh, PDP members. And so uh, knowing where we're coming from as a people, understanding our circumstance, understanding where the PDP administration left Nigeria, and the promises that were made to Nigerians by the APC then, who were surging to take over power, uh, they promised everything. They promised water, they promised light, they promised free education, they promised um, free housing, they promised prosperity, they promised the uh, stabilization of the Nairan currency. I mean, you now know that all those things were mirage, they were deceitful and fraudulent, and those uh, promises obviously have never have, have never come to pass. And so when you talk about the future of our country, you get worried as people who may, for one reason or the other, be deceived into believing that you just wish that it happens. And so the desire for me for a PDP administration that has internal mechanisms of good governance uh, cannot be overemphasized. And so I spoke to our people consciously, people within the PDP, to express the need for them not to sabotage our efforts in reclaiming power in 2023 so that Nigerians can see good governance. Because give it to the People's Democratic Party. One thing about us is that, yeah, there will be issues, as you expect in any human conflagration. But we have ways of dealing with those issues. We disagree for among, within amongst ourselves, and we deal with them. So it's better you deal with issues. And so, incidentally, and I will uh, the issues have been put in a different context. And some, some persons, majority of whom love me, majority of whom believe in me, majority of whom have confidence in me, majority who have very huge expectations of me, uh, rightly so. Because so, so, some, the interpretation that they gave it yes. was that you were asking that no Southeasterner should vote yeah, for a Labour Party candidate. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So, a huge expectation born out of abundant love and expectations. To say, look, that I am as calling any or every Southeasterner, Igbo man at that, or indeed Nigerians who do not vote for my party as supporters, that cannot be. That is far from the truth, it's obviously. That is not me, it's not in my character. I believe in even in dissent from within my immediate nuclear family. So that cannot be. My position was very simple. I was speaking to our people. I'm an NBC man. And the PDP has been faithful to us. The PDP has given us support. They gave us opportunity to produce a governor in our state. And I said to them, we have an opportunity. And I called that they should not sabotage our efforts to reclaim power. And that was it. That was the context. And if you read through all, if you listen carefully, and incidentally, I have found that perhaps a number of persons who have made calls, either to my person or to my family members or to my friends and associates, have not had the opportunity or the privilege to watch the tape. If you do watch the tape, you find the context was certainly, is suddenly being blown out of proportion. However, I am responsible to a people. When a people show you love, people show you confidence, people believe in you, you also have need to respect their feelings. And so to all those millions of Nigerians, particularly of the South East Extraction, who feel hurt by my uh, choice of uh, use of language, uh, I'm deeply sorry about it. I do not mean to hurt anybody, and they have a right, obviously, to express their political opinion um, in any way, form, or shape. I have a lot of my friends who belong to other political parties and will still relate, and, yeah. and will continue to relate. So um, it, it is my considered view that my people should accept me for whom I am and know that I am not um, a rude person, I'm not a disrespectful person, and I do not use words that are uncultured. I, am, uh, I thank God for the privilege of my upbringing, and mm. so that has guided me. <clears throat> And I, I believe that would, um, that, that would that should be able to assuage them. It's a difficult, I mean, not, not, it's, it's a dynamic and different political time now. Perhaps particularly more so for the Southeasterners because yes, they've yes, got yes. one of theirs who's vying for that position. Same for every other region. But for them, isn't that going to be somewhat um, difficult or challenging for parties, your party, the APC as well? Because if people feel, look, they think they've had enough 
of those parties. And so they're thinking now maybe just to go the way of Labour. After all, what was wrong with trying one of their own? How, was, how are those two parties, perhaps your party, how are you going to cope with that? The, the tension in the country is um, created by the terrible governance, the deceit governance by the um, current ruling um, APC. Everything they promised, they have failed to deliver in. Uh, we've seen worsening situation in every sphere of life, be it economy, uh, be it in security, uh, be it infrastructural development, be it in rule of law, in every facet of life. So Nigeria is actually on a descent, a fast descent. So people are worried. And so there is heightened disappointment amongst our people. There is frustration in the land that's very palpable. In fact, people cannot imagine what the future holds in stock for us. And so I understand that disappointment. So though for them, the established political institutions are a problem. But I caution everyone to be careful. Now, for the APC, I do not see, I caution everyone that they do not mean well and they do not have the capacity, they do not have the organization, they don't have the infrastructure, they do not have the conscience to give to Nigerians what we expect. For my party, the PDP, one good thing, we lost the election in 2015, and we internally accepted it, that we made mistakes. And we came out to apologize to Nigerians, please forgive us for our mistakes, and we pray for an opportunity. Now, for us, we see 2023 as an opportunity for us to correct our mistakes. But some say you're see... making more mistakes internally now. No, no, I don't think so. It, you, you, you see, now, across the zones of the Federation, from the Northwest, we're growing numbers. In the Northeast, the realization is becoming clear that the PDP is the option. In the North Central, it's the same. Now, in the South, South is the same. In the South, West, in South East, yes. In the South East, there are agitations born out of frustration that the APC administration kept the South East out of governance. And I mean, it's just really natural that our people should exhibit, show their frustration. A man won an election, unjustifiably, he took him out. That couldn't have happened in a pure democratic setting. And so there is palpable anger in the land. There's frustration. And so that is what has given rise to a movement, giving rise to frustration. I don't know if you understand it. However, I still believe that as the elections draw near, it becomes very clear the options, what they will be. And all I urge is we do not get so angry as to continue to make mistakes. But I think it's corrective for us. Mm. We in our party, we've learned, and that's why we're taking our time. You can see that what we are doing, we're being very deliberate. Two days ago, our president, I mean, we, 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 we set up, I mean, two days ago, the president campaign council was inaugurated fundamentally. As early as yesterday, our party came forward to, not, to have the first, the inaugural meeting of the presidential campaign council, and we're getting ready to start. And so those issues that we know Nigerians are looking for, we're dealing with them. And I'm certain that the, the events of present day would mm. inform and guide our actions and activities and how we respond to Nigerians to yet again okay. secure well, their the, mandates. We'll examine some of those issues that you've talked about when we return in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. We're with Emeka Ehedu, her former governor of Imo State. Well, speaking about the Southeast, there are many who wonder, uh, does the region, will they get it together this time, given the scenario that they are in? Because, I mean, if Labour Party is there, uh, BDP, uh, your presidential candidate was in Enugu last time out, saying, well, he is the most assured means of the Southeast getting the ticket, uh, getting to the presidency. And then the APC themselves also say, no, we have a say in the Southeast. So how do you see all of this playing out? Well, the, the, the Southeast people are indeed um, a blessed group, a right? blessed tribe. Um, Debo's are respected um, across the globe. We have the best professionals um, in Europe and America in various spheres of um, endeavor, various spheres of life, in, be it in medicine, in technology, in, in engineering, in science and arts, um, in law. And in, in this country, we've shown that we lead the way in commerce. And so our distinction is not in doubt, and we work hard. I, I know for the South East, we are a proud, hard-working people. Um, so it, it is important that we believe that we are given 
the right atmosphere, the right climate, right opportunity to excel, to um, showcase our individual capacities and abilities. And that's why we look for good governance. And that is what the APC has failed to give them. And so it's easy to dismiss the APC in the South is because they've had an opportunity. Did we give them those opportunities? We did Even not. Even though the state has an APC government in well, place? Well, I don't want to talk about that. You, 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 you know what you talk about. Um, legitimacy and illegitimacy. And what, I mean, look at a few days ago, um, they claimed that the federal government was um, uh, going to dredge um, the Orashi River and the river ports. I, as a legislator, I know um, that uh, ports, river ports, and dredging is exclusively uh, in the exclusive list. It, so it's not concurrently. So a state government cannot, in our present constitution, uh, undertake to do that. So yesterday, I, I saw the Minister of Transport um, disclaiming um, in every sense of the word that the federal government was ever involved. I mean, so that is what we talk about. Yet another so what the government was so trying to say is misleading. Well, well. I mean, it's for you to see the seats, and this is what they're all about. Today, they'll tell you they're doing this, which is not true. That's not how to govern a people. And that's why we have all the complications in the administration of the day. Because one, they were not prepared. They don't have the capacity to give the people what our people look forward to. And those are the questions. So for APC, obviously, going to this election, they know that uh, for them in the South, it's a no-no. Now, for the PPP, South East has originally been a, a a PDP dominated area, and now we have this labor movement, which you must factor in, arising from the frustrations of the people, and that's understood. And led by one of their sons that is respected and appreciated, hard working. I mean, so that gives us concern. But that means my party must have to work very hard, and that is what we're about to do. That was what showed uh, three days ago when Vice President Atika Baka led um, other members of our party to interact with the leadership of the South is to say to them, and it's important for us to be reassured that if for any reason we in the South East will give support, what are the considerations we'll give support to? And then he started addressing that. So we'll begin to look at it. If we are convinced, and then we'll have the message to take to our people, then we'll be able to offer our people to let, and listen. This is why you may go in this direction, and these are the circumstances, which I think in the next couple of days and weeks, uh, we'll begin to see what are options, what are the opportunities. Mm -hmm. But we will converse, given the strength and diversity of the People's Democratic Party, when we appreciate the fact that uh, to win a national election, you need to be uh, very well entrenched in the various zones of the country. So perhaps the advantage the PDP may have in the South is, is the fact that when election time comes, we now begin to look at the strengths of every party. And if our people are convinced that the PDP is indeed well entrenched in every nooks and cranny of this country and that they have the most potential to win the election, then that it might... Uh, uh, that might uh, uh, that might sweep the pendulum in our favor. Well, there, there are hurdles within your party, but le let's go to Lagos. Perhaps that will equally yes. pop up. Go ahead, guys. All right, thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Hedioha. Um, you know, just as you have said it, it's true that uh, the people of Southeast Extraction have capacity, competence. They're brilliant people. And uh, you uh, made a comment earlier about how the APC has denied them that, that opportunity for expression. Uh, but the same could have been said of the PDP denying them that opportunity for ex expression, particularly ahead of the primaries, when that uh, agitation was intense. For this time, um, the Southeast be given the opportunity uh, to be on the ballot, at least to get the ticket. Uh, that's on the one hand. Um, with, with due respect to your convictions as, um, you know, a PDP uh, stakeholder, um, what do you think about the emergence of uh, uh, former governor of Anambra State, Peter B on the ballot? Isn't this an opportunity for the Southeast to get that, uh, actualize that age-long dream of, um, you know, taking the number one seat in the country? Yeah, thank you very much. I, um, I, our party, I was one of those who advocated for micro-zoning of the uh, presidency to the southeast. If it was micro-zoned to the southeast, um, it would have been um, easy for us to have 
Um, a man from South is extraction. In fact, as a matter of fact, I told my friend and brother, uh, Governor Peter B, then when he was in our party, that um, we should focus our attention on narrowing the debate then rather than a broad southern presidency to southeast uh, presidency. If we had that in, uh, maybe um, we would have been in, in a good shape. But I knew that once it was left um, either to the larger south, I knew that we may not be able to make it. And um, so for me, you look at your options. What are those options? You look at partnerships that will work. And I'll give a man of southeast um, extraction an opportunity and privilege to uh, carry the cross of our party, to be the flag bearer of our party, uh, to win elections. And so um, that opportunity, unfortunately, did not come. And so what you look at when the opportunity, number one, you look at your options, option one, option two. Uh, Governor Peter B is a man that I enjoy a, a, a very good relationship with, a respectable relationship. I, and we, 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 we um, while he was in the PDP, we, he remained one of my closest associates in the service, and that is very was common knowledge. When he was nominated as vice presidential candidate of our party, I was one of the few early leaders of the South East who came and gave practical support. And I said, it was the right person, and I said it was right that Vice President Atiku Abaka chose him. Um, but that was then. And so now he's pursuing his course in a different political party. Now, the, the, the issue is that in the Nigerian context, and at this I say to my people, we, we need to engage. Engagement power is, is about negotiation. It's about discussion. The challenges in the country are far beyond uh, just the South. It's the national in scope. The insecurity is across the nation. You have insecurity in the Northeast. You have insecurity in the South. Uh, in the southeast, we have insecurity in the north central, we have insecurity in the northwest, we have insecurity even in the southwest. So uh, these issues come to the fore. And so advocating everybody looks at it. Uh, just a second there. First, why are you advocating for microzoning? point of view. May, may I come in there? Why are you advocating for yes. microzoning to the uh, south rather than the southeast? And why are you saying that uh, the issues are beyond the Southeast? Are you insinuating by any chance that the Southeast is not ready or not mature enough? Minds from the Southeast are not mature enough to take on the challenges of Nigeria. No, 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 no. That, that, that is far from the truth. What I said, I said if it is micro zone to the Southeast, then that means everybody that will contest for the office will be from the Southeast zone. But the moment you leave it open, then a lot of other factors will come into play. And then you have little or no control of that process. And that, that's the point. And so once it was thrown open, I knew that our chances were not as bright as it should have been. And that became the problem. So that became necessary that you begin to look at alliances mm. that can work. Okay, well, one, one of the things that also comes to mind in that regard, I mean, speaking to some of the issues that you've raised earlier, you know, in response to Chamberlain's questions, is that, you know, PDP is coming back, you know, having, you know, shown remorse and re-strategized to really focus on the issues in the country. The question that came to my mind was, PDP hasn't really been able, I stand to be corrected, play the role of the main opposition party since the APC came into power. I mean, those who you know, are aware would, rec would always refer to the days in which it was like for everything the PDP did while in power, there was a response from the APC. But most of the time, it would seem like the PDP largely said nothing, and it was just maybe the civil society organizations or the students or other people. And maybe sometimes it would seem like the PDP is trying to play catch up, you know, as an opposition party. So there are those who are wondering if the PDP has not been able to play the role of the lead opposition party as at now, what's the assurance we have that this party will be able to take the gauntlet? if given the power? Yeah, thank you. Um, governance is completely different from um, activism and different from uh, male opposition. 
the, the the APC said to Nigerians, so to Nigerians what they wanted to hear at that time. They told Nigerians, um, one, they were zero corruption. You know today the situation. Uh, we've never had um, a situation where not even the military era is as corrupt as what we have today. They, those promises were made. So for us, we focus on our programs for governance when we clinch power. So the emphasis now is how do we win election? And you do not win an election by shouting to us all the time. What we've been doing as a party is try as much as possible to penetrate to the various nooks and corners, strengthen our structures and get Nigerians to believe in our party to say that, look, these people are getting ready and we're winning converts across the country. From the six geopolitical zones, is big. it's obvious that PDP is the party to beat in the next election. Yes, we had the luxury of being in government. Immediately, democracy came uh, to being in 1999. So you could say, oh, we've not gotten out of that governmental uh, situation. Uh, now, some people understand the act of criticizing, and that's why they've forgotten that you criticize as the time to not govern. So they are looking at it. They, they can't provide that governance. For us, we would give Nigerians the government of their desire when, by the grace of God, we are given the opportunity uh, to be re-elected in 2023. And I believe we've learned our lessons. Like I said, when you listen to our presidential candidate, it's very obvious that he's a man that has um, significant working experience and that he's ready uh, to lead Nigeria from day one. He's a man that is prepared to offer leadership to our country. Immediately, he's sworn in as president. I think that's what is fundamental. Um, perhaps, While that, we, yes. unlike the APC administration today, we will not begin to learn, we will not begin to... Well, we, while, while that we is significant... Have that uh, do not have the luxury yeah. of waiting, we take off immediately. Yeah, yes. while that is significant, which you have said, and you also referenced your candidate now, who your party calls the unifier... But then, as Chamberlain asked you earlier, and we have raised it so, several times, the fact that even now it would seem like the PDP is a lot more divided now that you have a presidential candidate than before. So if that is the case, that there hasn't been a way to bring everybody to, let me use that word, unify everybody at this time, what's the assurance that that's not what's going to play out? under a new or a next PDP government? Vice President Atiku Abubakar is um, a calm, um, very matured uh, man with great institutional memory. And he has shown it in the way he's managed the challenges uh, in our party with calmness and candor. And I'm certain we would um, we'll get over this um, situation as we find ourselves. These are very normal. Disagreements are very normal in every home, in every family. And so you see deliberate steps we are taking as a party. Calmly, we are resolving those issues that have been attended to um, one by one. And you find out that by the time we get ready for election, by the time election comes, uh, PDP would have put all the houses in so order. So it, it would not have been too late by then because many still feel that he's not handled the uh, issues raised by Rivers Governor properly so far. But I am not <coughs> Vice President Atiku Abubakar. Um, I, I believe that um, discussions are going on at various levels. I believe consultations are going on at various levels. I believe engagements are also going on at various levels. And I am very certain, knowing the party very well and knowing Vice President Atuka Abubakar very well, uh, our issues will be resolved and but the PDP will um, um, give Nigerians the government of their desire. I am very certain we're going to win the election in 2023. And all I urge Nigerians is um, give peace a chance. Um, let's begin to... Uh, appreciate the issues. Uh, oh. As Atuka Baka has shown Nigerians that he has the message. Oh. He shows but, the preparation. But the more we try to give them a chance, I mean, people try to give them a chance, or party members try to give them a chance. They keep seeing headlines that you know, raise more concerns. Today it was about fresh crisis in PDP as NWC members, five of them returning 151 million naira rent. So it appears as though. Will this thing ever end? I'm not a member of the NWC of our party. Uh, you see, look, what I found out, the opposition tries to play up issues that are... Well, is what, this from opposition? I, I come to... What, what do you hear about the, PD, about the APC? What do, you hear they, about the, they, no, what do you hear about the APC? It's a party that operates like a secret court. We are a democratic party. And so in a democratic party, everyone looks at it and says, oh, these are the issues. Oh, I do not know the facts of this matter, but 
we have internal mechanisms of dealing with issues. And of course, um, if anyone said he was paid and he said he's returning the money, I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. they will deal with those. Those are, those are not the issues that will give us good governance. And those are not the issues today that we're looking at. What we're looking at is how do we get Nigerians to begin to say, look, PDP is a party that believes and offers. PDP sets the country up on a pathway to recover. Mm -hmm. PDP but sets Nigerians. I mean, when we came out from the military, PDP showed the light. When they came in, they said they were going, there will be light all over the place. What has happened with light today? All the progress we made in telecommunications. Well, I mean, so you see, we are getting prepared to offer governance. I would appreciate the despondence mm. amongst but, Nigerians. I but, doubt, but what, yes. As we wind down now, what would you say to those who think and analyze it, saying, look, from what they've seen, um, ABC is just going to Nikki, from what they see, because they cite that uh, the emergence of Peter being Labour Party weakens your party, because many of the people who appear to be leading the life for him are offshoots of your party, and so that may weaken your party's chances at the centre. Well, like I said, Governor Peter B is um, a politician that's earned his place. A man I respect and have good relationship with. And I know he has um, a growing support base. But we're going into a general election that is scheduled for February uh, 2023. And um, you need a lot of time to penetrate. And now, for us in the PDP, um, if you look at the leadership of our party in the Southeast, we, we were with Governor Peter B when he was in our party. And he's left, and we are there. You see that our numbers have not reduced by any means, and and we're going to approach the campaigns and the elections. All I urge everyone is um, let's be very cautious. The real danger is any opportunity to the APC, and so we should not inflict self damage on ourselves. Uh, we should continue. We put our eyes on the ball, and we continue. Um, to appreciate the situation, the circumstance mm. as it goes, and realize that only one man will win the election. Okay. Let's end quickly with this one, and shortly too, if you can. Uh, in Imo states, does the PDP have a chance? Will you be getting to the fray? Obviously, I mean, obviously. Um, our seven months in office, um, within that period, we showed redirection. We realized that, that yeah, we, we brought about confidence in the people. Um, economic prosperity, we restored autonomy of the local governments, and so people could see that life was possible, that government was possible at local government level. Um, we, uh, we, within that period, we activated every facet of life, be it our cultural revival, uh, rule of law in the states. Um, we provided for Imo people again, we gave them confidence again, the civil service, service began to reboom. Before I became governor, they were, they were not paying pensions for six, four months. I came in as governor, I began to pay pensions. Uh, civil servants were paid 70% uh, of their salary due. I okay. came in, I restored it to 100%. So there's confidence. So PDP obviously is the party to beat in Imo State. And obviously we're going to win the next election. All it's right. National State yeah. Assembly. And of course, when the time for governorship comes, that is the way to go. All right, well, we'll end it at that point. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Mecca Hede, her former governor of Imo State. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Well, let's just run through some comments coming through from you out there. While Henry says signing of the peace accord will improve cooperation among political parties, but it is not a panacea. And starting from party primary elections, the entire electoral process ought to be free, fair, and equitable. This is the way to achieve peaceful elections. Harry Awunonu says, followers of any candidate should tame their fanaticism, else it mutates into insurgency. The candidates themselves have roles to play here. Allow plurality of opinions, but use facts and figures in decent language and decent language to convince others. Is politics no longer a game? Well, first, uh, Saki Boyewa chooses to speak about ASU, and he says, let's put rhetoric and emotion aside. ASU problems can't be solved without money, and money doesn't fall from heaven like rain. I have children in Nigeria's universities, 
but universities should be 100% autonomous and parents pay for their children's university education, period. <laughs> well, we thank you for your comments. Keep them coming, and we also thank you for sharing your day with us. Uh, thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Have a wonderful day and a beautiful rest of your weekend. I'm Ayo Bankini. And I am Chamberlain Osar. Goodbye.